Well, hey everyone, welcome. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you for bringing us here together through the internet. We pray, Lord, that we can have a really meaningful time where we can really learn a whole lot about you. And all this we pray, amen. Okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at sacraments. And this is as well part of our training for First Communion. So if you are in the boat where you have not yet received communion and would like to, then this is training for that. Because part of the reason that that we take communion is because it's a way in which we receive God's gifts. We receive forgiveness of our sins. We receive strength. We receive um, all these comfort, all these promises that God is giving us. And so whenever we talk about communion, you actually have to be of a certain age. You have to be old enough to know what's going on. The worst thing that you can do with communion is just to simply walk up to the rail and look around and not really know what's going on. And then, oh, uh, I guess everyone else is doing this. So I'm going to do it too. That's the worst thing that you can do because the Bible even talks about how there's harm that can be done. So you can actually harm yourself spiritually by eating and drinking. It says you can eat and drink to your judgment. And so you need to receive the body in a worthy manner. And you also need to discern the body. And so, and if you don't do any of those things, you just walk up, then you could actually be eating and drinking to your judgment. So as a result, we take this time in our confirmation instruction to stop everything that we're doing and to talk about sacraments. Now, sacraments are two things. They're baptism and they are communion. And the word sacrament, which is from our previous lesson, is this idea that it's something that is sacred. It's something that is holy. It is set apart. See, as we go through life, there's so many things that are just common. They're ordinary, right? But there are also things that God says that are to be set apart as holy. And those things are things like his name, things like God's word, things like sacraments, communion and baptism. They are different. Even though we're just using regular faucet tap water here, whenever we combine it with God's word, it becomes baptism. And whenever it's baptism, it's not just to be treated just like any other washing, just like a shower. Although you should shower. And also Luther even says that in your shower every day, hopefully, that you're reminded of your baptism. You think about your baptism. But there is a difference between your shower and your baptism. Your baptism is something that is sacred. It's something that's holy. It is set apart. And so um, so that was last time. We talked all about how God gives us these gifts so that way we can have strength and forgiveness of our sins so that we can uh, receive him into our life. It is a means of grace. It is a way of receiving the love and forgiveness that he won for us on the cross. All right. So t today, however, we are going to be looking at baptism because we're going to spend all of this week just on baptism. Then next week, we're going to spend all on communion. So whenever we talk about the word baptism is we don't really use that word outside of church very often. And that's okay because, um, because it is a sacrament. Once again, it's something sacred, holy set apart. But because of that, it's kind of an odd word. And so you may say to yourself, baptism, what is that? Well, I'm so glad you asked. So our first blank here is a way to think of it like this. Our first blank is adoption. Adoption, entrance into God's kingdom. So we're all familiar with the term adoption. Uh, whenever we think of the word adoption, a lot of times what we think of is we think of someone who at one point was not in someone's family and then through a legal transaction gets to then become part of that person's family. In fact, I actually have a personal story of this. We have adopted three children of ours and we celebrate their adoption as often as we can because it is a huge, huge moment for all three of them, all different times uh, in our lives where we actually got to go and we sat down in this little courtroom and it's just like you would picture in the movies. There's the judge uh, in the black robe and the judge 
asked us to state our name, and so we leaned in the microphone. My name is Markel Ugg. And then, as well, my wife did that, and then this lawyer, which either ourselves or, in another case, the state hired and paid way too much money to do, sat there and read a little thing, blah, 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 blah. And then the coolest thing happened. The judge then said, well, by the power vested in me in the state of Arizona, and they slammed the little gavel. Actually, I don't remember if they did or not, but we can imagine that they did. And they said, here now, grant adoption into the Edge family. And so there was this clear moment where they went from not being officially in our family to being in our family. And the reason I love this analogy with adoption, whenever we think about baptism, is because spiritually we are born with the stain of original sin. And if you guys remember, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, we have the Garden of Eden. And it's this beautiful, lush garden, lots and lots of food. And God says you can eat of any tree, of any, any fruit of any tree in this entire garden. But do not eat the fruit of this one tree. He plants a tree right in the middle. And sure enough, Adam and Eve, they sin against God. And that was the first time that sin has ever been done in, on the world. And so we call this, it's the original sin. And because of that, ever since that they ate that fruit, ever since they bit into it, ever since that moment, all of humanity has been separated from God. And, and because of that, there is the stain now of original sin. So, so even if you think that you can live a perfect life, hey, I can live a perfect life, which by the way, you cannot, all right? Who you are and what you're born into is sinful. And so you are actually born not in God's family, as crazy as that sounds. How do you become part of God's family? Well, through the waters of baptism. That's right. So in baptism, even though that we're looking at someone having water applied and poured over their head, you know what's actually happening? Something very very significant is happening. You go from not being in God's family to being in God's family. That moment you cross over, kind of like where the judge slammed the little gavel and our three children went from not in our family to in our family. It's that moment where you are adopted into God's family. So belabored that point a little bit. Adoption is the first blank. Now the second blank here is who should be baptized? All ages, all ages should be baptized. Now, some people say, hey, you Lutherans, you guys baptize infants. I say, no, we don't. We baptize all in, all ages. And that's exactly right. You, you could be an infant. You could be 10 years old. You could be 15 years old. You can be 110 years old. And that's okay. Hey, by the way, if you are baptized whenever you're 110, Good timing, okay, because you're about to go meet Jesus, okay, and you may not have been otherwise. So, good timing. But if you are an infant, which a lot of times around here you'll see infants being baptized, there's a few reasons for this. Now, some people have kind of questioned this, and they've said, well, but geez, Mike, if a baby is baptized, what if they don't remember their baptism? Well, by the way, if you're baptized as an infant... I don't care what you say, you don't remember it, okay? If you're older, then you might remember it. But if you're a baby, you're not going to remember your baptism. And guess what? That is okay. It's not about remembering your baptism. And it's not as well even being old enough to say the words, I believe in Jesus. That's actually confirmation. Where you get to stand before the congregation in front of your family, in front of your friends, in front of God himself, and you get to raise your hand and say, I believe that Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. We get to say that at confirmation. In baptism, however, you don't have to be of a certain age. You can be a baby. And there's a few reasons for that. Uh, the first blank here, or it's not a blank, but it's on your sheet here, is that all are sinful from birth. And this is Psalm 51.5. All are sinful from birth, Psalm 51.5. Here's what Psalm 51.5 says. It says, David is writing this confession. And he says, from the moment that I was conceived, 
I was conceived in sin. How amazing is that? From conception, David is saying that we are born into the sinful state, the sinful nature. So as crazy as that sounds, now today we have this understanding of, of science and biology, right? Whenever the sperm meets the egg, we have this embryo, we have the zygote, we have this life, this person, this baby. Now, here's what we have, is that from that moment, you are already conceived into the state of sinfulness. Why? Because, remember, let's go back to the garden, the original sin is stained us. And so whenever we're born, we are born with this original sin. And we need something to wash away our sins, which is the waters of baptism, once again. So we are all sinful from birth, so all of us are sinful. And because we're all sinful, here's the next blank, we all need forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is a, is a very powerful thing. See, there's times in your life when you sin, when you do something wrong, when, when you know better, but you still do it anyways. The Bible calls that sin. And, and sin, remember, separates us from God. And, and now we have this shame. We have this guilt that is on us. And so we need to be forgiven of our sins, just like the person next door to you needs forgiveness of their sins. The person who lives across the world from you needs forgiveness of sins. Your parents need forgiveness of sins. Everybody needs forgiveness of sins. And, and since, since babies to adults to all ages need forgiveness of sins, we receive that through the powerful waters of baptism. So all need forgiveness. And then as well, it's, it's not about us doing something, but rather it's about God adopting us into his kingdom. Some people will make baptism into a work. They'll make it into a thing that we do to earn God's approval. And it doesn't work that way. So, so even though that, yes, we are, you do receive water applied to you. And yes, Pastor Mike or whoever is, is pouring the water over you. Think of it as a gift. It is a gift from God. It's about what God does in sacraments. See, sacraments are all gifts, remember? So it is this gift receiving rather than us doing something. We're receiving this gift. And what we're receiving is we're receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's go on. The next point here is there is power in baptism. There is power in baptism. Now you may say to yourself, well, how is baptism powerful? I mean, after all, all I'm seeing is just water being poured over somebody. And yes, that absolutely happens. Water is poured over somebody. But there is something that goes on spiritually that we do not see. Here's what it says in the book of Romans, chapter 6. Here's what it says. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. There is power in baptism. There is something that happens that we do not see. This verse that we just read talks about it like this. So just as Christ died on the cross, you remember that event? And then he was buried and then he rose from the grave and was given this newness of life. So too, that's what happens to us in baptism. We're actually, we're actually, yeah, we're actually killed. Our old self is actually dying. And then our old self is buried. And then we're given this, this newness of life. We're given this new life in the waters of baptism. So how cool is that to think that just as, as Christ here was died, was buried, and was risen, so we too, in the waters of baptism, our old self, our old sinful self, is died and is buried and is risen. And so we're given this new life here in the waters of baptism. In other words, something very powerful happens here. Our old self dies and we're given this new life. 
So then let's talk about this. What is the correct method to baptize? And the answer is there is no correct method to baptize. There is not a single correct method to baptize. All that's important here is that we apply water to the person. That's what the word baptizo, which is the Greek word for baptism, that's where we get the word baptism. Baptizo, it means to wash or to have water applied, to apply water to something. So um, back then, this was a commonly used word, baptizo. So it's like, hey kids, before dinner, go baptizo your hands, go baptize your hands. That's what they would say in Greek, baptizo, go baptize your hands. So then they would wash their hands for dinner. Now, that's that Greek word. And because of that, some church bodies have kind of gotten a little hung up on this word baptism and they think that it means that you have to be fully immersed like you have to go all the way down into a tub of water and every inch of your body has to be wet in order for it to come up in order for it to be right and well that's not really the case uh, all you need is water applied so we don't we don't get hung up on how much water is applied it could be a few drops uh, I, I like the shell pouring the shell, by the way, is a symbol for the Holy Spirit. And whenever it's poured uh, in the waters of baptism, that's a very nice symbol being poured over your head. And we make a sign of the cross on your forehead. That's very cool. And as well, I do like, actually, the idea of full immersion, of being fully underwater for a second. You don't want to stand there too long, right? A second, and then you come back up. In fact, I actually really like that, and, and I was baptized that way. I was baptized fully immersed. Now, I was a little bit older when I got baptized, but I was. I was fully immersed. And, and I like that imagery because um, you almost come up gasping for air, too. Like you're gasping for the Holy Spirit coming up. So it's great imagery, but you know what? If your baptism... If you had a little water poured over you or a lot of water, it doesn't matter. Um, now, some people will talk about, well, Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. And, and that's pretty cool um, that he was. In fact, if you get baptized in the Jordan River, that's pretty cool. And so some people think, well, if he was baptized in the river, then wasn't he fully immersed? Well, he could have been. But you know what? I wasn't there. Were you? So how do we know how much water was poured over him. He may have even been standing in a part of the Jordan River, which there are parts today like this, where it only comes up like ankle deep. How are you going to be fully immersed if it's just ankle deep? And so the big deal here is not to get caught up in how much water should be poured over someone, but rather the fact that water is being applied. And again, if you do it with God's word attached to it, then we have um, then we have baptism, all right? Um, how about this question here? Is it okay to get baptized again? Is it okay to get baptized again? You know what? No. <laughs> That's our blank, is no. Uh, it is not okay to get baptized again. If you've already been baptized and you know you've been baptized, because essentially think about that. What you're saying is to God, you're saying, God, the gift that you gave me at my baptism was not good enough. So I reject it. I want it. I want it again. I want another one. Now, I get the heart behind this. In fact, I hear people say to me all the time, you know, Mike, uh, well, first of all, I don't remember my baptism, which, by the way, is not a thing, right? Who cares if you remember it or not? Uh, my, uh, our uh, middle, one of our middle daughters, there you go does not remember her adoption. She was a baby at the time. So, you know, what, it doesn't count because she doesn't remember it, you know. But but for now, we'll, we'll take that. Okay, I don't remember it. But also, maybe this. Maybe, um, maybe I wandered away from God for a little bit. And, and, and people do that. Uh, in, in fact, uh, people can reject their baptism. I don't know why you would, but people do. And, and they walk away from God and then for a season and then they come back to the faith and and, and now they come back and say, you know what, I want to reinvest. I want to recommit my life to Jesus. And also, I want to get rebaptized. And I say, the first two things are great. The third thing, however, let's talk about. Why do you want to get rebaptized? Well, because I was away from the Lord. Now I want to come back and rededicate. Great. Rededicate your life. Do it. That's fine. But you don't need to get rebaptized. Um, 
In, in fact, uh, this is where I think the theology of adoption helps really, really good. Because let's say that one of my children were to become rotten children. I know. It's hard to imagine them be any one of my four kids being rotten kids. But let's say that one of them decides that they're going to run away. And then let's say that they come back home after a few days and realize it doesn't work out. And they got to come back home. Do we have to go and readopt them through our court system? No, they're still in our family and I'm still going to work like crazy to get them back. I can't control what they do, but I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to work like crazy to get them back. In the same way, our loving father will, will be hurt if you left, if you left him. Um, and he can force you to come back. He can, but he won't because Again, that's not, that's not a real authentic relationship then. If God is just forcing you into a relationship, then what kind of relationship is that? That's like a jail. It's a jail cell at that point. So he'll allow you to wander. He'll allow you to leave. It'll pain him, but he will allow you to do it. But if you come back to him, you don't have to get rebaptized. You don't have to get readopted because um, you're still his child. And he's still was working on you. And... Now he is rejoicing that you've come back. So those are great things, but you do not need to get rebaptized. The only exception to this would be someone who says, well, I'm not sure if I was baptized. And by the way, I talk to people all the time who are in that category. They'll think back and they'll say, I think I was baptized, but I'm just not sure. You know, uh, my parents were they didn't keep good records and we can't remember what church I was at. Was it at a Baptist church or, or a Lutheran? And so it might have, I mean, they, they think it was a baby dedication, but I'm not really sure if you're in that category and only if you're in that category, then yes, let's get you baptized just because we want you to have the assurance of your baptism and the assurance of your faith, get baptized. And if we all get to have, and it turns out you're baptized, you just didn't know it, then that's okay. But and if you have not been baptized, then hey, let's get you baptized. Uh, if you know as a fact you have not been baptized, then hey, let's get you baptized like, uh, I don't know, tomorrow <laughs> or yesterday. All right, let's let's do it. Let's get you baptized. No reason to wait on it. Let's get you baptized. Um, one other thing before we get to this last point here is um, what happens, let's say, if you're hiking in the desert, which by the way, totally happens here in Arizona, right? You're hiking in the desert and all you're hiking with a friend and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this rattlesnake jumps out and bites your friend on the leg. And then your friend all of a sudden is dying instantly. And your friend says, ah, oh, man, I'm not baptized. And you say to yourself, you're not baptized and you're dying. And they say, yeah, well, guess what? Because of the priesthood of all believers, you, if you have a bottle of water there with you, a lot of hikers do, you can actually open up the bottle of water and you can, if they want it, you can baptize them in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now that is literally the only time that you can do that. And you can do that because of the priesthood of all believers. If you're a believer, then that means you're actually a priest. Hey, pretty cool, right? You just got promoted today. You're a priest. But that is the only time that you're allowed to baptize somebody. If it can wait, let's say that you're hiking with them and you find out they're not baptized. They want to get baptized and there is no rattlesnake. There is no venom. They're not dying. Then you know what you should do? You should set it up with the pastor here and you should get baptized or your friends should get baptized here with the pastor, okay? Not in the desert and not by you. If um, you're on some retreat and it's really, really cool, like we're doing a beach retreat and your friend becomes a believer in Jesus, they raise their hand, they say, yes, I believe in Jesus, yes, I do. Yes, I believe in Jesus, how about you? And they're on the shores of the beach and it's cool because there's like the Pacific Ocean and the waves and the seagulls. And they say, you know what? I want to get baptized right here. And as a youth group, what should we say? We should say, no, <laughs> that's right. Unless there's a pastor there. If there's an ordained pastor there, then they can get baptized. But if there's not an ordained pastor there, then as a youth group, you would say, that's awesome. We'll set it up when we get home. 
And by the way, how cool is it going to be that we, as a faith community, rather than being out in the Pacific Ocean, faith community, we get to come together and celebrate this baptism together. And they get to invite their parents, they get to invite their friends, their family. And so how neat is it that as a faith community, we get to do this? But the big deal here is order. The order is that the pastor baptizes. Not you, unless you become a pastor, but not until then, all right? Uh, not not anyone else gets baptized, the pastor does, for the sake of order. The only exception, you're in the desert, rattlesnake, friend dying, not baptized, you have a bottle of water. That's the only reason, all right? Had to throw that in there. Finally, the last thing here, we are commanded to baptize. We are commanded to baptize. Uh, in fact, one of the things that we find here in the end of Matthew, because Matthew has... Uh, Jesus, he's just about to ascend into heaven. And it's like his final words with his disciples, his followers. And he says, therefore, go to all the nations. So not just stay here, but go to the ends of the earth. Go to all nations and baptize them in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we are commanded to baptize. This is not an option. I, I know some people... Friends of mine who say, oh, yeah, I love Jesus, I love the Lord, but I'm not baptized. And I say, well, then why not? (laughs) Let's get you baptized because it's a command. God is commanding it. So we are commanded to baptize. And we find that there at the end of Matthew. So here's what we have here with baptism. Baptism is the water being poured over us, applied to us in whatever method, full immersion, few drops, pouring whatever, with a show, with a hand, whatever. Um, Also, we have baptism is adoption, where we get to become a child of God. We get to be in his family. We all need it because we're all sinners, and the waters of baptism wash away our original sin. So, very cool stuff about baptism. Next week, we're going to get into communion.